Good afternoon and welcome. You're tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. Hey, thanks for tuning in. We've got a big show today. Very happy to welcome back. I say this so much, but it's so true. Everyone I have on this show, I enjoy a lot, and, and they're always great people. Two of my favorite sports guys in the entire world. First up is Ralph Sendrick. We'll be following up on his very excellent book, NFL Brawler. We'll talk about um, that book and some of the, the more interesting quotes in there, what players look for and agents look for in NFL teams. And then in our second hour, I welcome back Jess Root from Revenge of the Birds, a very excellent SB Nation blog. Been too long since I talked to Jess. Great chat with him. And then in my final segment, the final word was Sharona. This is a theme show. We're talking about David Bowie in that segment. The show features some of his it's so hard to pick some of his music, and we'll talk about his legacy and legacies in general. So I'm uh, very excited to, to share my thoughts with you guys on that. So we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get started. First up, Ralph Sendrick. So stay tuned in. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. <laughs> I'm joined now by Ralph Sendrick. Ralph is a former NFL player. He is a lawyer. He's a writer. Um, I'm still reading NFL Brawler, but it's fantastic. If you haven't had a chance to pick it up and read it, you should do so. Uh, I want to start with that. Mr. Sendrick, thanks again for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me on. And and that is Ralph. uh, uh, And the last name is Sin as in Cindy. Rich as in money, and I don't have oh. any. Now I use that line all. I use that line all the time because I'm from, I'm from a place in western Pennsylvania it's called Slovan. Slovan, Slovan. Yeah. It's where all the immigrants came in, and and you know you had you had the different pronunciations on the last names, but but I always if it's a K there, I always change it to make it an H, uh, like because I like the sound of rich. You know, it's like a Donald Trump. Right, right. right. Oh, and which by yeah. the way, we could we could probably get into that a little bit later. On, but go on, please. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because one of the things that I wanted to, to talk to you about was a little bit of a follow up on your book um, to see, you know, how the reception was. It really is fantastic. You're a very good writer. Most most attorneys um, do have that in, you know, in them because you do spend, you know, a significant amount of your time either doing it or or going through having your associates or whatever do it. So um, it, it was. It, it's really been a pleasure to to read it and and to um, to have that you know enjoyment factor. Well, thank you very much, and that's kind. And and you have to recall that that I was a football player, so mm-hmm. I had girlfriends who would always do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get married, you know, if, if you're if you're lucky, you find the you find the one you fall in love with, like, like I did with my wife, Mary. Uh, right. You you, you, have, you you have your wife you can lean on. Well, I'm just it's so funny that you mentioned that, and I'm just at the point I just finished the part of the book where I don't want to give too many spoilers to the people who haven't listening out there who haven't read it, but I'm just I just passed the point where you got a drink dumped on you. Um, and, and I gotta say, I'm loving Mary more and more every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know what? I was a little bit different of a character back then. <laughs> but I made it here. I made it here. You know, unlike some of the things that are going on uh, in the world today, uh, like what happened uh, with the Steelers uh, Bengals mm-hmm. football game, that was wow. something 
You know, I was a player in the 70s. We called, mm-hmm. we were called the headbangers back then, and guys mm-hmm. took everything, you know, steroids mm-hmm. uh, from the pituitary gland mm-hmm. and cadavers, the cadavers, right. on and on. I just or, read, yeah, I just read that. Uh-huh. But, you know, so you have you have all that that went on, but, but there, there has always been a, for the most part, always been a brotherhood uh, with NFL players mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, we, you, you're gladiators out there, and you go mm-hmm. uh, and you get paid mm-hmm. and all, and you, you get a free ride, and you get treated maybe special and all the other things, but but you, you don't, it's never been a part of sport ever anywhere uh, mm-hmm. to go out and maim people, to, to try to uh, uh, really cost them their livelihood. Now, right. you know, it happened way back with Daryl Stingley and uh, mm-hmm. uh, an all-pro uh, Jack Tatum, mm-hmm. uh, you know, did that and paralyzed the guy, and, mm-hmm. and so you know. I, and I got to say, I, I don't know. Uh, you have Donald Trump coming out and saying that the playoff games were were wussy, or he didn't quite say it that way. But you know, right, they right. weren't good games. <laughs> you know, that, that the rules now make it so that the players don't go at each other. Well, you know, it's not gladiator times anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, these these should be educated uh, young men mm-hmm. out on the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it's very interesting. You brought, you brought up the 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 Pittsburgh Cincinnati game. I definitely want to to ask you about that. One of so far, and there's so many things I like about the book. One of my favorite things about the book, um, of course, you know that I live in Tennessee, and of course, the Tennessee Titans are the local NFL team. They used to be the the Houston Oilers, and you played for the Houston Oilers and and Coach Bum Phillips. One of my favorite parts so far in the book is your quote from from Coach Phillips where he said there are two types of coaches, them that's fired and them that's going to be fired. And, boy, are we sure seeing that these days. Yeah, there's no there's no question. And, you know, I love Bum like every other uh, player, I think, uh, who was under him. And uh, he was just uh, one, of, one of those characters and able to really just uh, – uh, you know, pin it down. Uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, Bud Adams, uh, when he brought the team mm-hmm. to Tennessee, you know, I got a little story there that uh, I right. couldn't tell. Of course, he's a hated man or was in Houston, Texas, mm-hmm. because he left mm-hmm. the team, and that's uh, those feelings are probably natural. But uh, one time, uh, I just, uh, my dad sent me some coal properties uh, or something, and I said, go meet with Mr. Adams. I set up an appointment. Uh, you know, there were sheiks and all these other people in there. I didn't set up an appointment. I went straight down to his office, walked mm-hmm. in, asked the secretary, if I could see Mr. Bud Adams, and she put me in uh, a meeting with him. So uh, I know a lot of players and a lot of people have some bad things to say. You're down in Tennessee, but uh, uh, he always treated me uh, very well. Uh, but, yeah, you know, this, this this whole thing of what's going on in the, in the NFL, you know, I'm not sure where we stop at all. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, my, my feelings about everything, are really, you know, come from my experiences that are related sure. in the book. And a lot, yeah. of, a lot of that uh, as a player was from the Houston Oilers. Yeah, uh, Mr. Adams was a character. There's no question about that. And the, the, the feud with the city of Houston was infamous. And, you know, and it's still playing – some of those emotions are still playing out, you know, today with you know, his death and um, his his heirs are trying to really figure out what you know, where they fit in, in with all of that and, and what kind of happened. What's going to happen with the team? Uh, you, you mentioned your roots, and I wanted to, to ask you about. Uh, I, I really, I particularly enjoyed you um, setting the stage with your relationship with the coach who was injured during the war and um, lost his leg. I don't really. I'm trying not to give too many spoilers, but um, no, that I'm happy. I'm happy uh, that you would mention that and bring that up. That was my little league coach. And, I, I had I came from a uh, small town uh, where football where it really was like the, that that movie that used to be about the town in West Texas. Mm-hmm. It, that's mm-hmm. what football was. We had a coach, uh, and everybody in my my town were immigrants, uh, primarily Italian and Polacks and uh, Hungarians, uh, all the rest, Croatians, uh, mm-hmm. and. We, we had one coach who just developed a tremendous amount of pride in the community, Coach Ray Peroni, mm-hmm. uh, but it was started by Mario Gabarelli, my little league coach, who uh, he was just a tough SOB. There's no other mm-hmm. way to describe him, but, mm-hmm. but uh, he had lost his leg in World War II over in Normandy, uh, and he came back and he taught us lessons out on the football field uh, that all of us carried for the rest of our lives. And uh, from a small time, you know, we – 
we don't we didn't have a swimming pool or a okay. community center or any okay. other junk. Uh, we had a main okay. street about 150 yards long with uh, um, I think three or four beer joints on it. Uh, and what I'm saying is it wasn't a privileged community, but because okay. of the the close relationships we had with tremendous teachers, our town is just. Uh, it's, well, let me say, when I was inducted into a very nice, uh, uh, where, where I received an award, my town of, of these citizens had far more ads placed than anyone else. It's just that uh, our community has done so well because of sport, because of mm-hmm. football. It has a lot of problems. Uh, and, and, you know, would I want my kid to play? I don't know. Uh, uh, my kid did play. He played up to a certain level. Uh, but... Uh, Mario Gabarelli uh, in that leg and then putting in what it took for him to survive to us. Uh, and, we, you know, we always left it with uh, uh, a punch. You know, he'd all mm-hmm. – anytime I'd go see him when I was in the pros, I'd go down every mm-hmm. year, and, and, and he would love it. His mm-hmm. eyes would just – that was his dream. He lost that mm-hmm. dream in Normandy. Uh, but be, be, when it all ended, we would exchange punches and he said okay. when he told his story to his sister, uh, it's a reminder to me every time to, to say it's, uh, uh, life deals you a lot of punches, but it's how you take the punch that mm-hmm. makes the difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 thought it, really. I thought it was brilliant that you kind of set the background, sort of set the stage with that. And, and I was reminded of, of that story and, and the stories in your book regarding him when uh, Tom Coughlin was fired and, and then most recently with Coach Zimmer. Mike Zimmer in Minnesota taking some heat for saying what is absolutely the truth. You know, unfortunately, their field goal kicker missed a field goal, and he said, you know, came out and said, well, he's got to hit that. That's a that's a chip shot, and he got all kinds of grief over it. And I was thinking, you know, how coddled are we these days that a coach, a head coach, right. can't even matter of factly say something that. Everybody knows to be the truth, and and just gets. But I take a now. Let me put a different spin on that. Having been okay, sure. uh, one one of those guys who had to learn how to play on special teams, learn because I was somewhat of a uh, prima donna in in college. Uh, it didn't happen <laughs> in the pros. So, so you know you you didn't run after didn't have to run out on uh, uh, kickoff mm-hmm. uh, hot shot, huh? You well, you ain't on scholarship here, baby. You better mm-hmm. get your butt out there. I- I remember that from the book, yes. Yes. Well, you know, it, and, and it's true. Uh, so it's one of those things where you, where you have to do everything you have, you know, to, to learn how to play the game, and special teams mm-hmm. is a part of it. But mm-hmm. I've been in those situations. Mm-hmm. You can't get your hands warm. Before that kick went down, I tweeted, the worst job uh, in the United States, in the NFL right now is, is the kick holder, uh, the holder mm-hmm. for the kicker. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I know because, you know, it's freezing cold. Mm-hmm. You know, your toes are cold. Uh, unless mm-hmm. you're playing out there all the time, he wasn't. You can't get warm. If you're out on defense, uh, like I, maybe uh, I was in games like that, uh, I would be go all the time. But you're not getting warm, really. Really, mm-hmm. at least I didn't until somewhere midway through the first quarter, and, and you're going hard. Uh, you, so you know you're you're hitting in. You shouldn't be playing number one in that type of weather. I own dogs, and, and you could be prosecuted for having dogs out in that type of way. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? It's, just, yeah, it's yeah. bad. You know, mm-hmm. why do that? Mm-hmm. It's just you go be, and you make it more of an endurance contest. Mm-hmm. That's not what football is. It never was. Uh, uh, I can't say never was. I mean, they used to play those games uh, back with the Dallas Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers uh, mm-hmm. back in, what, the 1956 or something like that, 1958. Mm-hmm. I even have a program. But, but you know, that's. You, I think you put a heck of a lot on a guy, uh, especially a kicker and a holder. Mm-hmm. And I, it mm-hmm. may come down that it was the holder. He looked back. You don't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he was spinning the ball, and I'm not trying to lay the blame on anyone else. Uh, right, right. Not, not only that, you have your hand mm-hmm. down there, and you got someone who can kick, kick the heck mm-hmm. out of a ball. Who's mm-hmm. going? Who, if he's off a little bit, he's going to be kicking the heck out of your hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 in that kind of weather, it's hard on you because the ball's hard and it's not going to you know you get in when it's so cold like that. You've got to get every single detail right, and you right. know they've gotten everything right. I mean, the only points scored in that game by the Minnesota Vikings were by the kicker, and his name is Blair Walsh. With my as well, I feel terribly for the guy. I really do. It's just you know it, and, and, and I understand. You know, you don't want to 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 
pile on to the poor guy because, you know, he was a stand-up guy in the locker room. He answered all the questions and he cried. I mean, I get choked up just thinking about it because it really is. Um, but it, it it just to me, and I and I want to ask you, you know, being a well, coach, let me make one comment on the kicker. Sure, sure, first. sure. Yes. Every time I see that happen, I have empathy for him. Uh, but it's not quite the same as I do with maybe some other players because I always recall call during the double day practices the kickers over on the side mm-hmm, sipping mm-hmm. water and, and we had one <laughs> we had one, we had one knucklehead kicker that actually he sprained his ankle or something and he went over he he put his foot in our bucket of drinking water. Uh, no way. His ankle, after that, his ankle was okay, I can tell you, because we were all chasing his butt. But I'm sorry. Go ahead on with your question. Well, well, I mean, there's a reason why Peyton said that liquored up kicker, right? I mean, the kicking position is the ultimate you had one job, you know, right. that, that kind of thing. Uh, but it, it really does, you know, contrast how different it is being a general manager and being a coach in today's NFL versus you know, how it used to be. It's it's just an entirely different game, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, and and you know, there's good and bad that comes with that. Uh, you know, you're it, everything's under a microscope. Uh, mm-hmm. The players, the coaches, everything that goes on. And and you know, this is a different type of a sport. Uh, you know, you you have to in some cases control guys and what's going on. You have to enforce those rules. Uh, uh, and there might be a fine line at times. Uh, the criminals and guys who do really well mm-hmm. in the NFL. Yeah. You know, and mm-hmm. I don't think that's coincidental. Uh, I, I, mm-hmm. I think it's uh, you know it is a tough game, and intimidation and hits and mm-hmm. all the rest mm-hmm. are a part of it. And mm-hmm. you sign up for that. And nowadays, you know more that you sign up for. Uh, mm-hmm. But there, there, you know, there are other aspects of it that you don't. Uh, and those, those really, uh, what occurred like in, in in Bengals Steelers game, you know, that was a part mm-hmm. of it. You don't mm-hmm. sign up for that. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, you know, the NFL right now. The guys, you can't do a thing without everyone knowing it. And mm-hmm. what about Johnny Mansell? What about poor Johnny guy? Mansell? Yeah. I mean, you know, and him. But but you know, was he? I didn't see the final reports of whether or not he was actually under disguise in Las Vegas. But oh, mm-hmm. for goodness' sake! So, but you know, back in the NFL too, before all this media, Bobby Lane got drunk all the time before mm-hmm. the game. More mm-hmm. than a few people have documented that. I think even into the Steelers organization, mm-hmm. they would document that. And and, mm-hmm. and people used to say, well, that was the only way he could play in Pittsburgh on the ice, you know, because uh, he if he was went out drunk, uh, mm-hmm. it was like he was, you know, walking, staggering. So mm-hmm. you're on the ice, you know, it was just normal to him. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, back then people thought that that, that was cute. You know, nowadays mm-hmm. because of the brand and what it represents uh, in the shield, uh, you can't, you, you you can't have that type of conduct, and you know I think there's good and bad to that. Uh, I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's there's certain parts of it uh, that uh, you know it it might be okay just to let men and and workers. I think that you gotta let them be men. There's no question. You know, you mentioned the listen in the early days of the Tennessee Titans. There's no question, but that there were some Titan players who. Um, there there were guys who were drunk out on that field. I, I know that for a fact. It, it, but you're right. You know, you can It's it's a different game now with so much scrutiny. It the Johnny Manziel situation to me is is it, it's a little bit more complicated, I suppose. Maybe not, but for me, looking at that situation, uh, clearly he's a young guy. Um, he's a guy that the Cleveland Browns, you know, drafted in the first round. They wanted him to be the face of the franchise. You know, he goes to rehab, and and I'm sure that he made all these assurances to them, and he just can't seem to get out of his own way. I don't know that I you you to. would be you you would be a very nice mama. I'm afraid I don't quite feel that way. And let me say, I have a vested interest in Johnny Manziel. I'm looking at his Rolex watch that he yeah. wore at the ESPYS. Uh, when mm-hmm. he was a junior there, meaning he was an uh, amateur, maybe it was bought, mm-hmm. bought by, maybe it was bought by his dad, but I don't think yeah. so. But the bottom line is, mm-hmm. I, I bought it at an <laughs> auction because it was Johnny Manziel's, and I wanted, to, I wanted to get some good chuckles and all, all the rest. But, but you know, you're, you got to wake up. You know, that, mm-hmm. that, to me, that attitude yeah. is wrong. Now, mm-hmm. now comes the time, Johnny. Uh, okay, you could have been, uh, or you were a, a screw up. Uh, 
mm-hmm. you are a screw up. You also mm-hmm. have a, a heck of a lot of talent. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. it can mess with the NFL game nicely. We don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. There's no question that the guy applied himself. He worked quarterback. People, quarterbacks work their butt off. I mean, their days are, are just endless. Uh, and it's every day. They work maybe, maybe 40% more than the rest of the players in time and everything else. Uh, some may say even more with some players. Uh, so, it, yeah, you know, they're the star and the money and all the rest. But with all that glory and all the money and everything comes this rigid schedule, and really you sell away your life as a dad, mm-hmm. as a father, mm-hmm. as a husband, uh, mm-hmm. you know, during, during that time period where, you, where you're concentrating on football. Yeah, I think the thing about Johnny Menzel that stands out to me and um, it is what Joe Thomas had to say. And I don't want to spend too much time on him because I want to ask you about Chip Kelly and some other things. And we definitely need to uh, start our conversation anyway about drug testing. But Joe Thomas came out and said, you know, that his biggest disappointment in Johnny Menzel was that he he wasn't there for his teammates, you know. And, yeah. and, and that's the sad thing. That's the sad reality. You know, the Cleveland Browns, um, and, and, you know, so many people on that team who supported him, he let them down by by his actions, and that, you know, I think that says a lot. It says it all, and I really not much more to comment on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want, before we move away from, from your book, there's so much I could ask you about it, but I did want to, to touch upon one thing. I can't remember if we talked about this the last time or not, but one of the things that you mentioned you talked about with Mike Sam and, and the fact that you had played, uh, you know, with some guys who were, who were gay in, in the locker room. And, of course, it, Houston Oilers, um, I believe there was an infamous car accident. There, there, clearly there were guys before Mike Sam. But the thing that struck me about your book was that it didn't seem to be a big issue with the Houston Oilers in their locker room as long as the guys were there and played. Yeah, without question. Now, it was not open by any means, and I right, and, right. and I probably mm-hmm. yeah, and 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 I, whenever I talk about it publicly or what I couch it in such terms as as so it sounds as alleged because you know uh, I certainly didn't have a relationship with the individuals who were mentioned, uh, right? But right, right. Uh, but but the older guys who 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 were on the streets and who knew uh, would would talk and they would tell you and other guys would know so that the whole team would know. But you're Mm -hmm. right. Nobody cared. It wasn't a big deal. Even at shower time. I mean, it just wasn't, it was one of those things where, you know, you just went about your business and you left it alone. Uh, Mm -hmm. Someone was, you know, it was, it was almost like someone having a divorce, uh, going through uh, financial problems or whatever. It was just, it, it was their business. It was personal and stay the hell out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had, I played um, sports as well, uh, softball and volleyball and some other things too. And, you know, you're, you're going to have people, a locker room is very diverse that way. And I just don't, for me, I don't care who anybody sleeps with really. Um, but, yeah, that's that's not here that no there. I want to ask you. Well, you uh, must not be married then. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I mean, I well now besides my significant other, yes, you know, yeah. and and you definitely have to be more concerned about that than ever before. Um, but I want to ask you about Chip Kelly and uh, as a player, a former player, and an agent, and a guy who really knows the NFL fairly well. What led to Chip Kelly's downfall? And now I want to get into what agents and players look for in coaches and GMs and teams. You know, I think with Chip, uh, you know, there are certain rules, uh, morals, uh, mores that you follow in college that maybe you don't in the pros. And you, you need to adapt more to the, uh, to the, to the pro game. And, but I think the, the ultimate downfall of him was not, not uh, Chip the coach, but Chip the uh general manager, the player mm-hmm. personnel director, mm-hmm. you know, the one making all the chuck. It's too many hats, mm-hmm. uh, too many calls to make. Uh, and, and really with great teams, there needs to be input from the mind. Mm-hmm. You need to have mm-hmm. a good staff. Uh, uh, the uh, Houston Oilers staff that we talked about went uh, from Houston with Richie Pettibone, Larry Pecatello, Joe Bugle, to uh, the Washington Redskins uh, and uh, won all of those Super Bowl champions. I mm-hmm. knew of uh, championships. I knew they were good co- coaches back then. Good coaches are teachers. They're able to communicate. Mm-hmm. They're able to mm-hmm. get guys to do stuff that nobody else was able to uh, have them do. Uh, they're, they're 
there and really I've never been around a really good coach, a top coach who wasn't smart. You know, intelligence mm-hmm. is a big factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, what you mentioned the smart factor when as a as a player, of course, you know, guys want to play, right? And and if you get that opportunity, I suppose you're going to. You know, you're going to take it, but, but but for guys who have multiple options, what do they look for in in a coach? You know, I, a lot of times the players will first start with the other players on the team. What's it like to be there? What's the organization like? It starts at the top, uh, and so you have to have that there in place. For example, people would kill to play for Eddie DeBarlow of the San Francisco 49ers. I mean, it was mm-hmm. it was the team to play for. You know, a little story there just to give you a quick example. Uh, you know, they, they took a plane, and Joe Montana told this story. They, they took a plane that was a bigger plane than they were supposed to take because theirs wasn't available, and it gave everyone a heck of a lot of more room and first class and all the rest. And the 49ers uh, went at that game and just kicked the crap out of the team. And uh, mm-hmm. they went back to uh, Eddie DeBardo and said, boy, would you like to uh, keep with this plane? And he says, you play like that, it's yours, baby. And so, <laughs> you know, it's, you know that's. That's, you know that's an attitude that you know that you have out there to mm-hmm. where you know you're uh, it's it's the treatment of, of the players it's grounds root the ground uh, uh, ground swell grounds root and uh, it, that's a big focus of what goes on. You, you mentioned um, you know, the, the the Niners and uh, another story from the book. I hate to keep going. On. Maybe it's a good thing no, that please. we're going back to the uh, the the other thing that that kind of stuck out in my mind from from what I've been able to to read so far is that um, how important and you talked about this how important scheme is and and guys going to a team that that fits their scheme, and you were talking about the Patriots. And what brought that to mind is, of course, when you were talking about the Niners, you know, back in the day, uh, today it seems to be Bill Belichick, and I do think that he is a brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, coach. I, you know, I don't think there's any question uh, that he is that uh, and that uh, the organization is, is one of those uh, – and let me say this. There, you would never, ever confuse the Patriots with the 49ers nor the uh, management style of the owner of the Patriots with Eddie DeBarlow. Uh, those are on opposite poles. Uh, mm-hmm. The key in this business is success and they have the continuation of success. Uh, the Packers under the uh, under Vince Lombardi uh, had had really it was just about winning. Uh, so you know you know when you get to choices of players, uh, so you have a free agent out there and you're looking, uh, you want to make sure uh, if he's a, if he's a top flight one, you want to put him in an organization if he's a free agent where uh, he can go on and have have fun at the Super Bowl and other ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, the business is so delicate, the NFL, playing as a player that when you find success, when you find happiness, uh, and it's, it, you know, it's up there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a 50% or above, you, you're seeing that out in the NFL, baby. It's not time to move. I mean, you know, you, mm-hmm. now, you know, if you, you get out there uh, and you're, you're a top flight guy and, and, you know, someone's making you an offer that makes your nose bleed, you mm-hmm. got to do that. Uh, and mm-hmm. there are other times to where you want to leave that type of organ, uh, that bad organization mm-hmm. for that, 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 that sweet organization with not only the dollars but also, uh, also the makeup of the team and being happy. So don't ever underestimate when guys are talking about choices, when they, if they have a choice, talking to their buddies and teammates and finding out how much they really like that organization and the coaches. Yeah. Uh, the the player that I was I was trying to think of his name, I, I believe you were writing about Jim Plunkett and how um you know they tried to put him in an option system when he was you know really one of the best pure pa- passers in the game then. How important is scheme for the success and development of a of a player? Well, yeah, you know, for a quarterback, and especially one like Jim Plunkett, it is, it is, you know, it, you know, and I know they're talking about the analytics now of uh, you know, the uh, draft ball. What, what was the name of that? Uh, uh, the one movie that used all the analytics for baseball. Uh, uh, Moneyball. Moneyball. I just had a mind blank. I even wrote something on it. Uh, but that's insane stuff. That's that's not going to work in football. Uh, they've mm-hmm. tried that before. Jim Plunkett was a prince of a guy who who, uh, who doted over his blind mother and and uh, won the Heisman and came back and uh, really just Stanford straight up guy. Uh, and at uh, at New England uh, in his second year, uh, Tuck Fairbanks uh, 
uh, came in and, and, you know, with his uh, raw, raw college ways, a lot like this guy, you know, that we were talking about with the Eagles. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it, it was one of those to where, okay, I'm going to – we did it at Oklahoma uh, with, you know, Jack Mildred and Steve mm-hmm. uh, Owens and, and all the – we're going to do it here. Well, it mm-hmm. doesn't work. You, ha- you, you don't have in college generally the type of athletes on defense that you have in the NFL. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, J.J. Watt, J.J. Watt would – Okay, the argument is you would have five backup or substitute quarterbacks. Oh, that's nice. J.J. Uh, Watt would give you one maybe uh, after the game is over. The rest of them w- w- are out. Uh, mm-hmm. And each of those parts aren't uh, quarterbacks. They're not interchangeable. When you, mm-hmm. you know, It's a team, and, mm-hmm. and you need to have a quarterback in there with the team. Now, look, you can have a guy come in and give a, give a bump, give a buzz, you know, change up, and all of a sudden mm-hmm. the new guy is doing something great. But by and large, to have a championship team, uh, mm-hmm. if you have a change, that change has to complement the style. But mm-hmm. you're telling me you, you can do this with three or four uh, guys at quarterback and, you know, trying to do the pitches and the options. Uh, not only that, your back should just get totally chewed up. I think that that is so true. I, it, it, that reminds me of you know, kind of what's going on. We mentioned the Titans, the Oilers Titans before. Um, I think for them, with whatever they're going to do with their head coaching position, and I think it's going to be Mike Malarkey, simply because they want to keep some sort of continuity. You can't keep turning your roster over and going through multiple systems and expect it to work. Uh, the Jim Plunkett situation reminds, in a way, reminds me of Robert Griffin the third. Obviously, he's he's done in Washington. What do you think is next for him? Well, uh, I don't know. I think you know. I, I would have moved on this guy earlier and done something earlier than now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know that I would have let happen what happened. Uh, people say, "Well, you're an agent. What can you do?" Well, you know, buy my book. Uh, I just mm-hmm. don't. I don't like. <laughs> I don't like that story with him. I, I don't great, either. Mm-hmm. Great young man and all. But, you know, you you, you can get chewed up in this business. I mean, yes. you, know, uh, it, it, you know, it's not dissimilar from boxing in the sense that, you know, mm-hmm. that champ who, who has gone out there and been beat mm-hmm. up a, a few times and comes back in and maybe is uh, not quite as sharp on some of the things that he was before, he's just, he's just not quite as good, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and I, I don't know enough about that situation. I haven't followed it closely enough. But uh, they're doing well with what they have, and I can see all that. But, you know, I thought he was a stallion. I thought he was a guy that, I mean, I liked everything about him and, and I uh, hated to see what happened to him. I think that he could end up in Dallas possibly. They're definitely going to need to get somebody in there. And I know John, the Johnny Menzel to Dallas is, is very popular. Uh, to me, Robert Griffin III would be the better option. You know, he's a, a, a – I think that he could run – their kind of system. I think he can be um, very complimentary to Tony Romo and have an opportunity to, to you know, develop a little bit and learn and you know, possibly become the starter, um, you know, become the starter there. You mentioned Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. Um, a lot of things going on with that. I mean, is there the, the NFL, is there anything the NFL can do to control those situations? If there is, I don't know. I don't have the answer, and I've been around this game uh, boy, for a long time. I mean, mm-hmm. that's why everybody loves the NFL wild card. Mm-hmm. I love the chippy mm-hmm. games, mm-hmm. games where guys, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, just get it on with a give a shot, mm-hmm. maybe in the crotch or or in mm-hmm. the you know in the throat or in the, you know, but not something to take a guy out out of mm-hmm. the game, not something mm-hmm. to maim him, to hurt him for mm-hmm. his career, but the old-style mm-hmm. football games and what you saw Sunday with the Browns uh, and the Steelers was not that old-style uh, and what was trying to be accomplished by a few thugs uh, just doesn't have a part in the mm-hmm. NFL. It should never be a part of it. Yeah. One of the things that surprised me about this game, and I saw you tweeting about it too, and we're both familiar with uh, Pro Football Hall of Famer Mike Munchak. The, the situation with him and Reggie Nelson. These people are talking about him being suspended. I mean, Reggie Nelson ran into him, and it, to me, it looked like it was deliberate. You know that that he ran into him and hit him. Uh, Coach Munchak grabbed. Uh, he, he's uh, got long dreadlocks, and he he did grab them. Uh, what do you make of all of that? 
you know, I, I thought it was just, and I didn't watch it over and over again. I just saw it one or two times. And, you know, I thought the player put a little bit of oomph uh, on yes, the sidelines when he ran absolutely. into the coach. And, and I thought, uh, I, you know, you know look, I recruited my check, Munchak out of Penn State. This mm-hmm. guy was a bad, bad hombre. I mean, mm-hmm. he played tough. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he's not, not going to take it. You know, someone, someone is doing something to him that he thinks uh, he's mm-hmm. going to respond. It's going to be a natural right. response. Well, everybody's that, going to do that. I mean, that's yeah, just I mean, a natural least, human reaction. Well, and, and especially from a guy like Mike Munchak, uh, mm-hmm. you know, leave it leave it alone. That's where you're getting mm-hmm. picked you on it. That's where the rules. You want to talk about mm-hmm. that type of stuff? That's where the rules, in my mind, uh, you know. Just, it's going just a little bit too far, and I understand mm-hmm. now. You got to keep you got to keep the control of the game, and, right. and I, mm-hmm. I understand what people could look at. If you're if you're a Cincinnati Bengals fan, you could look at it and say, "Hey, look, uh, you know that was wrong on Munchak's part. It's all deserved against him." So uh, you know, it's just, you know, what side uh, you're looking at, and whether you have rose-colored uh, glasses on. I'm a huge Coach Munchak apologizer. Uh, I've been labeled that. I'm okay with that label. It does not bother me at all. I, I, I admire him greatly. I think that what happened to him in Tennessee was wrong. Uh, I don't know whether he wants to be a head coach again, uh, but I could see him being a successful head coach. Do you agree? Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. I mean, all the, uh, from the time I met, Munchak was, a client, you look at the clients in my books, my book, and you and you see the quality of the person, uh, mm-hmm. how they conduct themselves, and mm-hmm. you know you go, you see Al Toon, Jeff Saturday, Trev, Al, you mm-hmm. go through the list of guys, and Mike Munchak belongs in there. Uh, he's a credit to his profession. Uh, there's, you know, whatever happened there, uh, let it go, uh, right. especially with a guy who has a sparkling background and character like him. Yeah, you couldn't find a better person. I think Coach Munchak, I completely agree. You may not want to share this, but I want to ask, why did you pick Pittsburgh over Penn State? Uh, You know, I think one of the main reasons in in, in looking back, uh, number one, my dad was uh, somewhat influential and uh, always, and he said to me, if you're going to make a name for yourself, make it at home because Mm -hmm. more, more likely than not, you're going to end up back here. And, and I was down in Houston, Texas, and I got my law degree there and all the rest, but I did come back here, and it was true. And so it was one of those that you can go almost anywhere, but if you're going to end, where do you think you're going to end up living? Yeah. And if it's in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh made, made the most sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's, we, we've got to talk about this because we had a, a little bit of a discussion on, on um, social media, on Twitter about it. I think that um, the NFL, the sports in general, <laughs> I think drug testing is outdated and outmoded. I think that they've got and, – and there's some movement afoot to to change things. You don't seem like you agree with that. I think that they should regulate things like HGH and, and other substances. Why do you disagree? Oh, hell no. I mean, I, I, I think ever be uh, brought up uh, – uh, Number one, it's artificial. Number two, there's always something else that comes. Uh, number three, it has long-term negative effects. Number four, if if individuals find out that it's uh, that uh, the uh, something from cadavers, pituitary gland of cadavers, an injection from that can help you more. They'll take it more. It's mm-hmm. the mentality of it. Uh, you're never going to stop it. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is, uh, you know, the essence of being an athlete is being able to be pure and to do it on your own with all the extra stuff. Did I Mm -hmm. take some of the extra stuff? Yeah, I did. I took shots, uh, uh, a lot of pain pills, a lot Mm -hmm. of that other type Mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, And and after my third operation for a three-week period, I took a, I think it was called Diana Ball uh, for three weeks. But But you know all the negatives that are going back. Mm-hmm. But my body was so – I was 198 pounds after I had been like 230 pounds or something. Mm-hmm. And so I was uh, – because I had all these operations, I was trying to get back fast. But I knew even then, under those circumstances, you were going down a wrong path. Yeah, but you talk about long-term effects. I mean, the game itself is going to, to leave long-term effects. And HGH, while there's some – um, evidence that there there might be possibly some per- performance enhancing aspect to it. Mostly, it's a re- it recovery and to help you get healthy and, and get back on the field 
and for me, I don't see how different that is from, you know, from the other things that you do, the pain shots, and uh, and I'm reminded of the Jason Taylor story, other things that he went through, you know, to stay on the football field. Well, I, I don't see how different it is. Yeah, and, and I suppose it is a matter of uh, perspective there, but uh, when you take the pain pills uh, and you do take that shot, it is to get you through that one play that one time. Uh, you know, does do I have to take HGH to compete on the same level as another individual? If we are equal uh, and he's taking that, then, you know, maybe I'm okay with that. Maybe then it does become in the category. But if he has a competitive advantage, it, mm-hmm. it goes to every sport, to weightlifting, mm-hmm. to wrestling, to all the rest, and to basketball. And, and, then, and then you have players – Overdosing, or you know, mm-hmm. I'm gonna say overdosing, taking mm-hmm. more than they need because, right, right. because everybody, everybody will do it. I did surveys back in the, the 90s, uh, and players would give away years of their lives to play in the NFL. Now mm-hmm. they're coming out of college now, you know, and you know they're not in their 60s or not or, mm-hmm. or whatever, but uh, they're willing to give that up, and you know that's. That's perhaps understandable. I mean, maybe a lot of us there because there's so much uncertainty and so many things you have to face. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, if it's readily available, they're going to take them. They're going to start there. It will go in high mm-hmm. school, uh, and at some point it will be in junior high. Yeah, I, I understand. I understand the flip side of it. Um, the, you know, the bottom line is you're, you're always going to have, and, and guys today are always looking for that edge or taking supplements and, you know, and, and, and things of that nature. It's an interesting discussion. Uh, my thought process on it is, is evolving, constantly evolving on it. Do you want to give me a, a Super Bowl prediction? <laughs> well, yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. well, are, are you rooting at all for Pittsburgh? I know you're kind of a Pittsburgh guy. Well, you know, I, I used to hate Pittsburgh, the Steelers, because, yes. I, of course, I grew up here, but I played right. for the Houston Oilers. And right. with Bum Phillips, you know, we talk mm-hmm. about Bum Phillips. Uh, he said, well, last year you know, and the year before, we were knocking on the door. This year, we're going to kick the damn thing in. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> down in Houston, Texas, some people went nuts down there because they have a mm-hmm. lot of Baptists. And, and you, know, you know, saying damn wasn't mm-hmm. something you should say. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that was Bum. Uh, so I was, you know, I used to have to come home at Christmas time and listen to all those stupid Steelers songs. So <laughs> I, I live here now, and I live I live in downtown Pittsburgh, and and uh, I have a, the back side of my my complex uh, my uh, my uh, condo uh, faces where the parade will go if they win a Super Bowl. So I w- mm-hmm. I don't even have to stand out in the cold. So yeah, hell yeah, I'm a fan now. <laughs> well, it's hard not to, you know. You get indoctrinated. I. I grew up and father taught at the University of Texas in Austin. I was a huge um, University of Texas fan when I was younger. Of course, then I went to school at the other UT, and you definitely become indoctrinated, and now I follow the big orange and the real orange and, and, and all of that. You've got one book under your belt. Any plans to write another one? You know, I have put together uh, really a textbook that has everything I possibly could need to just put it out there, and it'll be a unique textbook in the sense that uh, it's a hands-on. It tells you, you know, uh, even going into how you take care of injuries to a certain degree. So one of those things that that uh, you know, when you when you go into uh, law and you look at a textbook, it's generally just a theories and all. In Supreme Court cases, this would be something mm-hmm. uh, different. I have a couple of other ideas too, uh, but uh, you know, I'm just getting over this last experience and, <laughs> and still learning from it. Uh, and you know, uh, I, one of the things you have to do always too is to keep keep uh, you know, your name out there to keep marketing. Right. But, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and I sure do enjoy that time I spend on the beach with my granddaughters. I'm sure that you do. I hope that you will. Um, it really is an excellent book, NFL Brawler. If you haven't had a chance to read it, you, you, if you're a football, fan, if you're if you're just a fan of sports in 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 general, you, you should definitely read it. We didn't get a chance, and I didn't plan to to talk no, wait, about. I, add, I, I, I have to sure, add sure. one thing. Okay. One thing on that. It's a love story. It's it a is love a love story. story. It's yeah, definitely I, I, a love I, I, story. I, I, of a woman, but of the game and and, mm-hmm. and the people who are involved in mm-hmm. sports. One thing you said you were going to ask me on. Well, I was just going to, we didn't even talk about it. And, and if you're 
uh, a fan of the law. The one thing that I, I didn't, I intentionally didn't um, ask you about, but I'm very, and I hope that you will come back and we'll get a chance to chat about this, is the sure. legal aspect of it. And I practiced law for a long time. I don't practice anymore. But I, so, so much of what you wrote about in there uh, rings true to me. And I, when I first started as a very young uh, I was in my third year of law school practicing. Um, you were able to do that under the guidance of a, a practicing attorney with guidance, sure. and uh, we did criminal law. And one of the and I, I I say all the time. I know you'll appreciate this. One of the reasons why I got out of it is because. Uh, you learn very quickly that you represent criminals, and they lie to you as much as, as they lie to anybody else. And 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 so that part of the book really kind of struck me. I was like, wow, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yes, and and you know that when, when you apply that to uh, that, you know what goes on there to even mm-hmm. football and recruiting and the type of players that you represent. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not fun to represent those guys who who aren't stand-up guys who aren't mm-hmm. didn't take advantage of the education at their school or, mm-hmm. or didn't have didn't learn the right uh, the right things growing up. Uh, it's fun to represent the guys who conduct themselves like like gentlemen uh, like mm-hmm. folks. Uh, that's yeah. that's what it's all about. And 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 my book uh, I think relates that uh, thoroughly. Also, that oh, I there think so guys, too. There are guys who are stand-up guys who who say, uh, one of them. Uh, if we can just go missing that kick, was there anybody in the locker room for that kicker? Anybody on that team? Mm-hmm. It happened when the Buffalo Bills to the New yes. York Giants and yes. Scott Norwood's kick went wide right, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. everybody was gone in, in in the locker room except Scott Norwood with reporters around him, and he was very lucky to have uh, my client Kent Hall from Mississippi State. Buffalo Bills Pro Bowl guy who was there for him, sat down with him and said, listen, uh, this is from the New York Times article, if we all would have done a little bit more, if we if we would have done this, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter, but we mm-hmm. all are a part of this, uh, and 40 yards was by no means a chip shot. Now, get your clothes on, and he went out. Yeah. Uh, he shired, went out, uh, and, and they met the, the press together. And if you want a definition of a leader, uh, that's the definition of the leader, and, and uh, obviously, I, every time I even talk about the story, I get choked up a little bit. I'm getting but, choked up uh, just listening to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, yeah. Uh, he, he died. Mm-hmm. He died way too young. But but he, yeah. uh, Thurman Thomas uh, said that uh, I owe sticking on my Hall of Fame uh, uh, jacket to uh, Kent Hall, uh, Jim Jim Kelly. All all said the same thing, and and uh, Bill Poley and. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, there are so many bad things that come about from the game that people can point at, but there are also those positive values mm-hmm. and those great stories uh, mm-hmm. about great men, and, and that's one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Uh, it's so so much fun to talk to you. Tell everybody out there where they can find you on social media. And, uh, is there – when can we look forward to your next book? Any sort of timetable on that? Oh, my. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. So I have a couple, you know, I do have a couple of ideas. I do have a couple of ideas now. And, and, I hope um, that you uh, will. Well, thank you. That's so that's so nice. And you know, from what was cut out of my book, I mean, uh, it, it, it's okay to swear just a little bit on this show, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> just a little. Well, well, no. But it, it was it was the biggest argument on my book when you have other people involved is whether or not I should be talking about how much I love my wife's ass. Well, oh I yeah, no. Little, That's you know, one of my these, favorite parts about it. Let's see, Swirsky, we're sitting, we're sitting. Uh, uh, so, so I get my hair cut when my wife goes. So we're sitting in there, uh, and and it's all these Pittsburgh girls, and I'm reading this this line editor who's saying, you know, you know, you want your grandchildren to read about your wife's ass and what you're thinking, of. and and I, I said to these, am I wrong here, ladies? And to it, to to it, to a T, all of them. Hell no. You gotta leave that in there. That's you good. got That's to listen. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't even mention it. I, I almost put in here. I wanted to talk to you about um, sugar kids. Ooh, yeah. How about you know, let, the let's hope. the the quarterback who married the Playboy Bunny? And yes, I, I, and I, and I was gonna put you on the spot and, and ask you what your artwork was, but I was like, no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, no, that's, you know what? That's, 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 
kind of a favorite story, too, that going in there with Duke. And a, and a true story, you know? And, and, and really got, and I really loved kind of it. A, I loved everything yeah. about it. Well, you know, he was a Playboy bunny, and he had big jugs. I mean, so, oh, you know, you know? one of those stuff. But I, I, we'll, next time up, we'll tell that story. All right, that sounds great. Thanks again for joining me, and uh, tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Social media, I'm on uh, uh, Facebook at Ralph Sindrich, R-A-L-P-H-C-I-N-D-R-I-C-H. I've already done the Cindy and Rich thing. Uh, right. But uh, uh, on uh, Twitter, uh, at Ralph Sindrich, uh, gets, me, gets you on Twitter. Uh, the book, NFL Brawler, it's, it's, uh, it's on the website, mm-hmm. uh, uh, NFL Brawler. It's uh, on Sindrich.com, and also, uh, you know, I when I when I'm ordering, I order through Amazon. Yeah, uh, and we'll tweet out the Amazon link for everybody. And the website. And yeah. the website. And the, the website. website. Yeah. Always such a pleasure. Thanks again so much, and have a great day. Thank you, and you too. I okay, enjoyed bye-bye. being on. Bye. I enjoyed it too. Bye bye. That was Ralph Sendrick, former NFL player, lawyer, and agent, talking about his great book, NFL Brawler. I'm still reading it. It's fascinating. You definitely should pick it up. Up next, Jess Root of Revenge of the Birds, a great SB Nation blog, talking Arizona Cardinals and NFL playoffs. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. We'll take a quick break and then come back. That was Ralph Sendrick, former NFL player, agent, and lawyer. His book, NFL Brawler, is so fantastic. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about it. If you love sports, if you love football, if you're a player, if you're a college player getting ready to hopefully realize your dreams and enter the National Football League, I encourage you to read it. If you can't read, I encourage you to listen to it. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Our educational system is broken. Uh, There's little doubt that some of our nation's young people come out of our um, lower educational systems with not terribly equipped to deal with a lot of things. There's a lot of work to be done there. Hopefully, you know, in in the years to come, we will continue to work on that and, and do a lot better. Uh, there's little question that some, you know, that some football players um, are herded through the system through no fault of their own. You know, they're just doing what, you know, what they do. They play football, and education often will take a, a second, second class status to that. But definitely um, avail yourself in whatever mechanism suits you best of this book. It is so fantastic. It discusses a lot of different things. Uh, One of the more fascinating aspects of it is how uh, Ralph goes into the draft process and talks about, you know, some of the darker sides of football and and how it can seriously chew up uh, our young men and and what it 
you know, what the process means and, and different ways to handle that. It, it's so excellent. I can't recommend it enough. You can buy that on his website. We'll be tweeting that out or on Amazon, NFL Brawler. It's an excellent, excellent read. I, I'm still reading it. <clears throat> I'm roughly about halfway through. I can't recommend it enough. And, and great stuff on the NFL and and Coach Mike Munchak. I want to talk about him just a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen regarding you know what went down on the field between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Pittsburgh Steelers. It, it's an interesting dichotomy. We um, you know we love football for um, you know for in a lot of ways for the violence that we see on the field, the hard hits, the um, you know the the drama, the um, you know the the interaction, both good and bad, between coaches and and players with each other and with with you know, um, you know with the media. Um, but it's it's a, a situation where I think there's a lot to be learned, and we can possibly do better. You know, with how we handle things, Vontae's perfect with his three-game suspension that just came down. I think that it is a very warranted suspension. This was not a a situation where uh, Burfecht was um, acting out of character. He was acting very much in character. He has a long, lengthy history of of fines from the National Football League and, and of dirty plays on the football field. Hard hits aside, there's simply no place for that kind of conduct, for that kind of activity. And and I think the NFL acted, you know, correctly. You could argue the semantics of it. Should he have gotten more? Is it too much? I don't think that it's too much. I think um, if you're arguing that, you're not, um, you're missing the point. I think that it definitely could have been a lot more. Uh, the more interesting topic to me is Pac-Man Jones as a Tennessee uh, native, <clears throat> someone who lives in the state of Tennessee, he followed Pac-Man Jones through the early years of his NFL career and had an opportunity to see him off the field as well. Uh, I feel like I've got a pretty good handle, you know, on on who he is, and and so I have some some thoughts on on him. He came out, you know, he was a guy who was penalized in that game. Perfect was. Uh, ironically not was not nor was he tossed from the game but Pac-Man Jones came out and said that um, he would apologize to Antonio Brown but only under one condition and that is if Antonio Brown were to miss this next football game um, this weekend <clears throat> against the Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati against the Kansas City Chiefs well, Pac-Man, I think that you don't understand what an apology is all about. Apologies don't come with conditions. Apologies are without conditions. They express remorse. They show that you get it and that you are um, sorry, you're regretful for your actions and, and the harm that your actions did. And it's pretty clear that you are not sorry, that you do not regret it, you're apology, and I use those words laughingly, are insincere. They um, they exhibit a callous disregard for what happened on the football field, for what, um, for, for the possible damage that was done to Antonio Brown, and, and it really, you know, it, it, it's not all that surprising. Pac-Man Jones, throughout the course of his career, has shown a shocking lack of ability to get it. And, um, you know, he's been able to <clears throat> resurrect his career and go on to have, you know, a pretty long uh, career. Comparatively speaking, when you look at, you know, the average career of, of an NFL player is about three and a half years. And he's been playing, he was drafted in 2005, so he's been playing uh, 10 years now. Uh, he, he doesn't get it. He's never going to get it. Uh, I think it's pretty clear now that we know who Pac-Man Jones is, and he's a guy who, um, who is going to do what you know what he does, regardless of consequences, regardless of 
of um, you know what what it means to other people. It, it's rather unfortunate, but you know that's that's kind of the way it is. The Bengals in an interesting situation right now. They're going to lose uh, Hugh Jackson to someone. He is going to become an NFL coach. Long uh, the next in a rather long list. They lost Jay Gruden and Mike Zimmer uh, to head coaching positions last year, and both of those guys. Uh, a couple of years ago, both of those guys had uh, very good years in, in 2015, both teams making the playoffs. be interesting to see where Hugh Jackson lands, where he ends up. I'm a big fan. Um, I think that he he picked a rather inopportune time to call a bad football game, with, in, in my opinion, uh, last weekend, and they were knocked out of the playoffs. We'll see how that um, how that transpires. We'll take another quick break when we come back. As promised, Jess Root, an Arizona Cardinals guy, he uh, operates Revenge of the Birds, a very excellent SB Nation <clears throat> excuse me SB Nation website. Full disclosure, I've written for SB Nation. There are a lot of great people there. They do a lot of great work, and I was very proud to and to be associated with them and, and to write for them. Really interesting con- conversation with Jet. Jess, the Arizona Cardinals are favored to win the Super Bowl. We'll talk about the matchup with the the Green Bay Packers. This matchup features two of my favorite football teams in the Packers and the Cardinals. We'll talk about Coach Bruce Arians. Is it possible that we might somehow get Bruce Arians to be our next NFL commissioner? We can only hope. So stay tuned in. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. We'll take a quick break, and then when we come back, Jess Root. All right, welcome back. As promised, I'm joined now by Jess Root. Jess uh, operates, runs and operates the awesome Arizona Cardinals uh, website for SB Nation, Revenge of the Birds, which is one of my favorite um, uh, fan-based websites uh, over there. They've got some great, uh, great content, and, and it's been too long since I've talked to Jess, who was a, a guest on uh, a podcast that I used to host for NGSC Sports. Jess, thanks for, so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Okay, thanks for having me on. I appreciate you having me on again. It's been a while. It has been. It's been too long. I'm so excited about the Cardinal season. Jess knows that I, I'm a closet, not really so much a closet Arizona Cardinals fan. I love Coach Arians. We're going to talk about him here in a minute. Uh, some really exciting young talent on that team. It's been a great, great year. Uh, they are entering the divisional round this weekend, going to be playing the Green Bay Packers, another team that, that I like a lot. So uh, it's it's a fantastic matchup. Uh, the, the last match was decidedly very much in the Cardinals' favor. Uh, I don't think it's going to be quite that lopsided this time, though, do you? Oh, heavens no. I mean, 30-point wins, 30-point losses seem to be the aberration. Yeah. And and especially a team that was, I mean, the, the game went sideways. It was, they were already, Green Bay was already down their starting cornerback. They were already right. down their left tackle. They lost B.J. Mm-hmm. Raji in the game. They lost a couple other offensive linemen, and so the floodgates opened. Yeah, and and so no, they're they're playing confidently. Uh, they got kind of their swag back. I I I I'm not so I don't buy into the fact that Green Bay's back because they really didn't play fantastically all year. No, um, they didn't. They really didn't. But mm-hmm. if if the Cardinals play the way they should, I mean, they should win this game. Um, and, and even I could even see them covering the seven seven and a half that that is expected. 
Um, other than that, I mean, it's not going to be a 30-point game. I'd expect it to be within a touchdown, maybe 10 points. Yeah, you mentioned left tackle situation. The the Packers' offensive line is very much a concern. Uh, they went last time. They went with Barclay. This this time around, you know, they made a change the last game. They're going with J.C. Treader, and he played very well. I thought for um, you know the the stage that he was on and the experience that he had, and um, so it does look like it's a very I don't want to use the word serviceable, but um, you know, it, it it was a good move for them. Yeah, and the the one thing that sort of the game that they matched up the very first time, the pass rush of the Cardinals had wasn't anything they had the entire year. And the floodgates open. I mean, Dwight Freeney, you know, they had his sack party. Calais mm-hmm. Campbell, Marcus Golden. I mean, it was a little bit of everybody. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's it's just another one of those cases where uh, it should look like like a regular playoff game. <laughs> it's what mm-hmm. you come down to. It'll look like yeah. a playoff game. There was an interesting question on ESPN.com. I, I tweeted it out as I was uh, preparing for this interview with you. And thanks again, by the way. I really do appreciate it. It's such a pleasure to have you on. And, uh, I'm, again, just so excited about this game this weekend. But the, the question was, which number one draft selection, and they're talking about the quarterback position, would you want? Uh, Carson Palmer is one of them, Peyton Manning, uh, Alex Smith. People forget that Alex Smith was the number one overall selection, too, or Cam Newton. And it's a, it's a great question. And, and all of those guys, I mean, Peyton, um, not having the year that, you know, that he's had in the past, uh, sort of the t- twilight of his of his year, but still a very good quarterback in his own right. And, and obviously, I mean, you would want Carson Palmer, wouldn't you? Well, if you're talking right now, um, you, you, you'd have to talk. For me, it would be a toss-up between between Palmer and Cam Newton. Uh, yes. The, yes. the reason why you think you would lean towards Cam Newton, if you're only talking this year only, yeah, I'd take Palmer. Um, he's he's still playing at a very high level, and he's he I think really he's a is. better quarterback. He plays mm-hmm. the quarterback position really as well as anyone in the mm-hmm. league. And, and, and this year is sort of in the case where he – became the quarterback that mm-hmm. everyone thought he could be coming out of the USC, only mm-hmm. he never sort of – he got there almost, then mm-hmm. sort of fell off. And, but Cam Newton, if you're, if you're going to look beyond this year, I don't think there's a – it would be crazy not to take Cam Newton, seeing what he's already done and what he still can achieve, because he even hasn't mm-hmm. even come close to, a, to, to, to peaking as, as a passer. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with that. And um, and when you consider their situation at, at wide receiver, and um, he, he's definitely one of the the more probably it would be a toss up maybe between him and Russell Wilson as to which one of them are uh, you know, the most exciting young quarterback in the league. There's a lot of talent there. I completely agree. Uh, you might think you know the Carolina Panthers in that conference championship round that would be very exciting. Um, if, if it's in Carolina, I'm going to be covering that game. So uh, we'll we'll see how that how that transpires. I want to ask you um, as I was again as I was preparing, something struck me, and I didn't go do the research. I, I was going to rely on you on this, but the Cardinals have two 1,000 plus receiving wide receivers. When was the last time that happened? It was 2009 uh, when they had a really, really good deal in, in Larry Fitzgerald and Anquan Bolden with, with Kurt Warner throwing to them. In 2008, they actually had three that year when ah. with Warner. They had Fitz, they had um, they had Bolden. They also had Steve Breston who who squeaked mm-hmm. into yes. a thousand yards. Yes, and, and, and then parlayed, and then parlayed that a year after a year later into a, into a 25 million dollar deal with the Chiefs. And he, he yes. never was quite the same health wise, and he never. Could, I loved. I loved Steve Breston. He was one I of my favorite too. players. But yeah, so we we haven't seen a passing offense out here of this uh, of, of this prolific nature since since Kurt Warner. I mean, it hands down. <laughs> yeah, that it's, it's 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 amazing, and I'm so happy for Larry Fitzgerald, who uh, unfortunately during the prime of his career didn't play with. You know, he he got a couple of years, a few years with um, Kurt Warner, who's uh, going to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. There's no question whatsoever in my mind. Um, we're not going to have that debate here. But um, he's not, he's is he up this year? I forget. Where is he in that process? 
Uh, Warner, he was a finalist. I think he was in the final ten last year. He's a finalist again this year. Okay. All right. Um, so th- that was pretty exciting. But I want, and, and everybody knows what Larry Fitzgerald is capable of, and I'm so happy for that guy. But the one I want to talk about is your young wide receiver, John Brown. I'm a big, big, big fan. I, I've bought heavily into him in fantasy football. What has his emergence meant for that, that Arizona Cardinals offense? Well, you can look at a couple of things, and you 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 kind of you think about the the season that Larry Fitzgerald has, and you can mm-hmm. point to really kind of two or three things as to uh, what caused that research. One of them is John Brown, um, mm-hmm. because of what he did on offense a year ago, the threat that he is down the field. Uh, he's a quietly a very very a very confident receiver. He's like a lot of receivers. He, he made a, a – and it didn't come out in the same sort of press clippings as you normally get because it was kind of asked. He said he doesn't think anyone can cover him. Um, but it wasn't said in a brash, you know, Richard Sherman type way. It was said in, in a quiet John Brown way. And his he, the combination of his route running, the, the fluidity of his movements in and out of the, his breaks, and then just his out-and-out breakaway speed – makes him the perfect receiver for what Bruce Arians wants to do. And if you look at Bruce Arians' track record with drafting receivers, mm-hmm. there's kind of a um, kind of a mold that he picks. It's third round later. They're smaller, very fast guys. Look at some of the guys that he's picked up. He's got, um, you know, he's got Antonio Brown. Mm-hmm. He's got Emmanuel Sanders. Uh, it, all he's got basically he's got a number of these types of receivers who who are that same type of guy. T. Y. Hilton is another one. I was going to ask you who, well, if he was responsible for T. Y. Hilton because he came to my mind when you were mentioning Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah. Yeah, he was on that Colts staff when when mm-hmm. they drafted, and so he's he's that type of player, and so he moves in and out of his breaks, he gets down the field, which makes him so good. Um, and that spread, the, and the combination of the receivers they have um, between Brown, Michael Floyd, and Larry Fitzgerald really makes it impossible to key on any one. Um, but Brown has such a big, I mean, you look at what T.Y. Hilton did in year two, year three, uh, you, so you see Brown crack a 1,000 yards this year, and he really, he left yards on the field because there were a couple of drops out there. Yeah, he did have some drops. Uh, uh, but you see the potential of what he can be, mm-hmm. and, and you think, you know, mm-hmm. given given the right situation with another year, he could be an Antonio Brown type player, especially the way the league is going in terms mm-hmm. of passing offenses. It's just astronomical numbers mm-hmm. across the board. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. You mentioned uh, the Cardinals having three uh, 1,000-yard receivers. Uh, Michael Floyd came pretty close. Right now he's at 849, and he had a big game against the Packers the last time. So, you know, you have to mention him, too. As And he's just a, you know, he's a guy. He doesn't give a, get a lot of attention, but he's a solid wide receiver in his own right. He is. Uh, he's, what hurt him this year was were a number of injuries. He started off mm-hmm. the preseason in training camp. He came down and and broke some, dislocated the fingers, some fingers in his hand. He came down really funny, came down on his hand, and he had some bone. And actually, he showed, he's kind of grossed out everyone. He had bone pop out. It, it, was, it wasn't a fracture. It was a dislocation. Nothing broke, but it popped out of the skin. Uh, and so it took him a while, and, and John Brown played well enough, kind of took his starting spot, so he came, started out slowly. His career has been marked by inconsistency. Entering this year, he'd had you know, as many games where he got at least 90 yards in a game as he had less than 30. Uh, so he he's big and he's down. And, and this year it started out the same way, but then over the last eight weeks of the season, and I sort of think <laughs> I jinxed him because, you know, he'd never <laughs> had a stretch like this. So they, uh, entering the final game against the Seattle, he had had over those those previous seven games five 100-yard, five 100 yard or more games and another of 70 and then you know nothing happened well right against Seattle and it was the best thing you look at and say he finally developed into the guy and and he they would have had three if he'd have been healthy all year likely uh and and Bruce Arians he's the thing about Floyd 
you, he's kind of been the forgotten guy because he's almost been disappointing because he hasn't developed into a star. And that, mm-hmm. that's kind of what they drafted him to be. But right. he, gives the, he gives Bruce Arians a little of everything because he gets side and he's got top end speed. So but Arians isn't used to having that, a guy who's as big and physical he is with that same top end speed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it, it's pretty amazing that the the Cardinals offense, when you consider the the offensive drought that they went through for you know for several years, how how prolific that offense has been, and I'm so happy for Car- Carson Palmer. Uh, he, he stayed healthy. He was really doing well before he went down, like and, and so were the Cardinals before he went down last year. So I'm happy for him. Uh, he, his name has been in the the conversation for most valuable player. It does look like Cam Newton is probably going to walk away. Um, I, I know that there's been one vote. There's I think there's another MV, MVP vote that's still remaining out there. So kind of be interesting to to see how that have, how that goes down. Uh, David Johnson was a guy, another guy in fantasy that I bought heavily into. I drafted him. Everywhere I got a chance to and held on to him. I know a lot of people were, you know, with the emergence of Chris Johnson, were starting to to move on. But I, you know, I, I, as a person who watched Chris Johnson's career, I was like, well, you know, it's kind of hard <laughs> to, for me to buy in. So I held on, and I was very, very happy that I held on to David Johnson. What has his emergence? And, and uh, you know, he almost I, I, I haven't crunched the numbers. He has right at a thousand yards from scrimmage as well. He does, he does, and and that's it's really kind of amazing to see what he did over the final month of the year. Uh, it was an interesting trade. I think it was Bojina, Josina, and Anderson from ESPN, uh, who said he, there was an insider he talked to, she talked to from within the organization is, you know, uh-huh. they were that stacked at running back the Cardinals were to start the year. They could have turned David Johnson into the rookie of the year if they wanted to, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. between Andre Ellington and Chris Johnson, they didn't need him, and so they they brought him along in little bits and pieces. I mean, playing at the small school that he did, you don't want to overload a rookie that much that Mm -hmm. early, and they didn't. And and he's paying off in big dividends now because they they had him returning kicks. They had him, you know, in in passing situations. He's really dynamic as a pass catcher. He really is. He really is fantastic. Uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. that. That, I think, is one of the... The things that is, is is the most fun to watch about his game. Well, it is because he's built so big. I mean, six yeah, one, two twenty four, mm-hmm. and he's so fast. But you see him run routes, and and this is in part because that when he started college, he was a receiver, so it, it, mm-hmm. the position isn't foreign to him. But you you see him, and especially with his size, the way Bruce Arians talked entering twenty fourteen about Andre Ellington, about being a guy who's going to get the ball, going to touch the ball mm-hmm. 25 to 30 times, you know, mm-hmm. 20 carries, 10 catches. He never held up. That's what David mm-hmm. Johnson, and, and that's what David Johnson is. He's that type of guy, only he's mm-hmm. bigger and, and ideally sturdier a player. It, it's, it's almost like they, they took Andre Ellington and turned, they had the same guy, and supersize him. Bigger and supersize <laughs> yeah, him, yes. Right, yeah. Uh, another guy on offense that I want to ask you about, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the defense, and and that is Darren Spells. Uh, I, I, you know, I love Uncle Bruce. Um, I just wish Uncle Bruce would use his tight ends a little bit more. Uh, Darren Spells is a guy that's always intrigued me. I think that um, it, it, if given the, the chance, he could be um, you know one of those pass-catching tight ends, but it doesn't seem like that's in their offensive game plan. It's not. The tight end position, and I'll, I'll give you kind of the, an, an insight here. Okay. They have a tight end that they throw the ball to. His name's Larry Fitzgerald. Okay. But yeah. he's not a tight end. That's how they right, use right. Fitzgerald. Yeah. They, a, lot of, think, a lot of teams use yeah. the, kind of the, the flex back where you got your Jimmy Grahams or you got mm-hmm. your Robert McCountcy. Mm-hmm. The way they use Larry Fitzgerald in the passing game is a lot how a lot of other teams use the tight ends. And so they, they do a lot of one tight end, two tight end sense. But mm-hmm. those, in those one tight end sense, you know, Jermaine Gresham, Darren Fells, they're there mm-hmm. to block. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and to be an outlet if necessary, mm-hmm. they have their pass catching tight end. He's named Larry Fitzgerald. Only we don't we don't insult him by calling him a tight end because he's so much better. But <laughs> right. that's the role he plays in a lot of a lot of mm-hmm. other offenses. It's the same type of thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's a brilliant observation. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but now that you mention it, that makes an incredible amount of sense. 
Uh, on defense, uh, of course, the, the, your, your defense is, is very good. It's been good for for a pretty good while now. Losing Honey Badger, that was a blow, but um, other guys have stepped up. But I want to ask you what the, what the addition of, um, oh, gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Let me look through your roster real quick. Dwight Freeney. Um, how how important has his addition been to that to that defense? Well, it, it's a number of things. One, one, I mean, he's been there and done that. And two, mm-hmm. he has the talent. Um, you saw. I mean, I'm not personally a big guy in, in to talk about the number on pressures, and that's like kind of a new next generation start, stat that everyone uses to talk about the number mm-hmm. of pressures, and because. Mm-hmm. So many big plays happen off of pressure plays. And good mm-hmm. quarterbacks, it, I mean, good quarterbacks when they're pressured, they make plays. Bad quarterbacks mm-hmm. and average quarterbacks when they're pressured, and when they're pressured uh, negative plays happen. But uh, when, they, when they are looking at sort of the metrics, the, t- the coaches looked at over the last couple of years, he was still getting making disruptions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and they looked at this defense and say, you know, we're going to keep him on there 20, 25 plays. Mm-hmm. He's got a uh, Pro Bowl defensive tackle heavy. He's never had a better defensive tackle ahead of him. He's mm-hmm. never had the secondary behind him. So if we mm-hmm. stick him in these particular situations, we think he'll be successful. Guess what? He had, what, four sacks over his previous two years? He's got yeah. eight this eight. year and a half yeah. a season. Yeah. <laughs> and so he, yeah. he's given the, you know, the element they had in 2013 with John Abraham, you know, yeah. the, the guy mm-hmm. that you're going to, they can't, they, they can't mm-hmm. block one-on-one. Freeney's, I mean, he's he's not going to do that consistently. But mm-hmm. what you get is he can beat guys one-on-one when their other pass rushers, uh, you know, Alex Okafor, he's not mm-hmm. really a one-on-one guy. He's a cleanup yeah. guy. Uh, he's a secondary. And, he's and a secondary he's factor. And he's injured now, right? I wasn't he exactly is, injured. and that's what? a story that hasn't been told yet. Yeah. He was just placed on NFI. It sounds like you know the it NFI is. list. That's a bad list to be on, uh-huh, especially this yeah. time of year. Bruce Arians in, in his presser today said uh, he wouldn't talk about the, in, the toe injury that ended up end uh-huh. his season, and he said you'll have uh-huh. to ask him. You know, yeah. the Cardinals' experience with the NFI list has been this. Jonathan Dwyer last year after his arrest, mm-hmm. and then there was mm-hmm. the, the allegations that he was, you know, was threatening to hurt himself. And they uh-uh. pushed him on us at NFI. Years ago, when the, after the Cardinals drafted Thomas Jones, Thomas Jones ended out of town. Um, he broke his hand, allegedly on a telephone. Mm-hmm. Answering a phone? He punched a telephone or something, broke his hand. Mm-hmm. That it, 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 those type of things, Jason Pierre Paul, that's an that's an NFI type thing. So he was mm-hmm. a, it sounds like he, he, from the impression I get, the team is unhappy with what happened. Yeah. And so he was a knucklehead about something. Mm-hmm. That story will probably come out and, and yeah, now they're down Okafer. Yeah, they added Jason Babb and he's a guy who's uh, been in the league for a while. He's bounced around a little bit. Um, do you like? Obviously, they had to do something. Do you like that addition? I, you know, he hasn't done anything in a long, long it's while. Been a pretty good while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's been a long while since he did something. But uh, as a guy, you know, if they give him a role, a Freeney type role, okay, you go after the quarterback in this situation. It could be successful, mm-hmm. um, but they needed a body back there, and so mm-hmm. they've, they've got some guys right now. I think he's at the back of the depth chart who might get mm-hmm. a few snaps here and there. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your other injury situation. Um, there was some noise that Chris Johnson might come back. We haven't heard any news about him. Give us an update. Well, uh, because he was placed on the injured reserve designated to return, the earliest, the absolute earliest he could come back based on the eight-week rule is if he he can come back only for the Super Bowl. Okay. He's ahead of schedule. Okay. He started working out. He's, he said he's ahead of schedule, um, and he, he's actually very, very happy the team decided to put him on that and to bring him back. Okay. Now, there was no loss to do that because mm-hmm. that was the last week they could use it, mm-hmm. and he was a significant enough player that – that they do that. He's been back on the field. He can't officially practice yet until, right. I believe, next week. But uh, I believe next week he will be on the – he says he'll be back on the field full throttle. And he says he expects – I mean, they, they didn't shut him down. If they, they put – they made designated for return, he feels, because he'll get used. And, and I think he will be probably the bell cow, at least early on in games, um, come the Super Bowl if, if he's there. Because – 
in a Super Bowl, as important as a guy like David Johnson would be, he's still a rookie. And, and mm-hmm. Bruce Arias has proven has proven to me over the past couple of years, while he's willing to play young players, he's not willing to count on them. And so he always has a backup mm-hmm. plan. Yeah. Yeah, he prefers veterans. There's there's no question about that. Uh, I think the thing that weighs in David Johnson's favor is he's a much better pass catching back than, than Chris Johnson ever has been. And uh, and if you look at the numbers, you you know you definitely see that Chris Johnson um, putting up really good numbers in the running game. But he's just not, despite his speed and despite everything else. Uh, and, and I've watched him up close and personal for a long, long, long time. He's just not a guy that you want to rely on. You know, in that passing game. Any other injuries that you're you're keeping an eye on? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, on the offensive side of the ball, things look good. Um, oh, Carson good. Palmer, you know, dislocated his finger during that during that. I can't remember which game it was. It was Philly against the Philly uh, against the Eagles. That's fine. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, they had a couple of key injury. Uh, uh, you know, Marcus Golden became their very consistent pressure on the quarterback. He should be back this week. Josh Morrow, a rotational guy on the defensive line, should be back. Um, but the bye came at a good time because they were starting to get banged up. And, and it looks like, at least for now, everyone will be as good as they could be. And, Andre Ellington isn't going to be 100% probably into the offseason. He's still dealing with turf toe, but he's, he's well enough to play and to play at an okay level. I had not noticed, um, I guess maybe I had missed this or just, it hadn't stuck in my brain that the Cardinals had added DJ Swearinger. Is there a role for him on that defense? Um, well, right now, how how the things play out, it's the all their safeties are healthy. He is their seventh defensive back when they go with with the seven DBs, which they do every once in a while. If if you still count David Buchanan as a defensive back, right. he's basically mm-hmm. an every down linebacker. But if your terms of charting. You, if you count him as a defensive back, they will go from time to time with with seven DBs. Swearinger is at seven DB, and he was when Rashad Johnson was was out. He was a starter. Uh, mm-hmm. He was a starter out there. What, and you, which was, what was your impression? Well, fierce, and he played much better. Uh, I mean, I mean, the reputation he got, you know, the, the alleged allegations were he got cut because he refused to play special teams. What, what did he do? The first, I mean, we saw him the first two weeks he was on the team. He was out there on special teams. Uh, so whether he was humbled or, or there was a misunderstanding of the report, he's been, he's been great. And he's, he's, uh, he's intense, which is what you want in that backfield. And he's, you know, the, you know, where he's playing within the rules, he hasn't had that issue where he's been outside of those rules yet. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. I was a fan. I'm still a fan of him, and I got to see him a lot, you know, playing in the SEC. And, and you know, you always want guys to do well. Are there any matchups in particular that you think our listeners should be on the, the watch out for? We've, we've pretty much covered everything. Any other matchups of interest to you in this game? Well, I'm particularly interested in to see well a healthy Packers offensive line, how they hold up, well, and how the Cardinals' pass rush goes. Obviously, minus Okafer bringing Golden back, will the Cardinals be able to generate that sort of pressure or even some sort of pressure? Because that's sort of been their thing all year. Mm-hmm. They are very good front-running defense, if, if I can call them that, without being insulting to them. Um, because they they stop the run very well, but the way they're built, um, personally, I've seen as if they have a physical team that stays close and is able to run the ball physically, they do wear down. We saw it in their earlier losses in the season against Pittsburgh and against St. Louis. But everything else, it, they've been able to stop the run, which limits them to to the other team, and plus their offense scores points, and so it makes mm-hmm. them a one dimensional on offense. The Packers, and if what the Packers were able to do is run the ball successfully. If if they are able to run the ball like they did against Washington, which I don't think so, it should be an interesting game. Yeah. I, I'm inter- I, Again, the kind of the matchup that we'll want to see is it like last time is Justin Bethel against James Jones because mm-hmm. Aaron Rodgers picked on him all mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. All game, and for the most part, they were they were insignificant games. Yes, many of them for first downs, mm-hmm. but it picked up the big interference call down the field. Mm-hmm. 
He he, but he didn't so get the interception. So that that's a that's a matchup that's going to go both ways. But that's a good that, that's a very good learning experience for him. Yes, and, and the one thing that that Bethel, who for the last two and a half seasons, uh, the coaching staff and players have raved about his talent, talking about how he he's as athletically gifted, if not m- more, than even Patrick Peterson. And Patrick Peterson, who is as is, is athletically mm-hmm. gifted as you'll find, and has turned mm-hmm. himself into a shutdown corner. So it's a matter of now, is he getting the reps out there on the field? But is he going to give up plays? Because, you know, Gerard Powers, is, as much as people have not liked him in that corner two role, he's a better corner than Justin Bethel. But Bethel has a higher ceiling because he's not as smart as, as Powers has been. Mhm. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a fun game. I, I'm very excited for it. A lot of good games this weekend. I want to get your impression on them before I let you get out of here. But I don't want to leave the Cardinals yet. I have to ask you. It's still early, and I'm not trying to jinx anything. But do you have an off season wish list yet? Well, I mean, obviously, the the main thing is. If you're looking ahead, I mean, the offensive line looks okay. I, I think they need to address the center position. Mm-hmm. Um, they they are adequate there with Lyle Sunline. They brought in A.Q. Shipley, but they've addressed every other position every single year, um, either with a high-priced free agent or, or a significant draft pick uh, the past couple of years. And they need a pass rusher. A, mm-hmm. a, a luxury would be, okay, who's going to be the guy to succeed Carson Palmer? Is it mm-hmm. going to be here one more year, two year years, three more years? At some point, somebody needs to take his place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, and speaking of that, and I meant to ask you this earlier, Gerald Ger- Washington, you don't hear a lot about him. He's still on the roster. He hasn't played in a couple of seasons. Obviously, he still has. You know, He has to reapply, and um, he still has the domestic violence uh, conviction out there. And it, it would be... Really, it would be it would go against the odds for him to be effective at this point, don't you think? I if if there's one thing that we can do by reading between the lines that we know about, he's done as a cardinal. There there are, there are whispers out there. There there's some reports out there that the cardinals are trying to recoup some signing bonus money. That mm-hmm. to me is number one because the only reason why they haven't cut him right at this point is because of salary cap implications. If they can get signing bonus money back. He will be done. But they don't have to do anything because right. he's still suspended. And, and as far right. as we know, there's been multiple violations. The, the Glazer report came out, said there are multiple violations while he was suspended. The, the commissioner said nothing has changed, so it hasn't come to him yet. And so obviously Washington hasn't been done doing what he's supposed to. And even right. then, if and when he gets reinstated, he's still probably looking at you know, anywhere between four and eight games suspension after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really sad. Um, it, Carson Palmer is, you know, um, is, is having a fantastic season, but he is, you know, getting on up there. Uh, it's hard to think that Drew Stanton is the answer once Carson Palmer is done. At what point do they address the quarterback situation? Uh, well, Steve, kind of tell you, they try to do it every year, but they don't. They're, I mean, it's going to come via trade. But which probably not gonna happen. It's gonna come via draft unless they're lucky. Unless they unless they mm-hmm. magically can find a Kurt Warner off the trash heap like they <laughs> did many years ago. Mm-hmm. And even then, Kurt Warner after they signed him was still on the trash heap even with yeah. the Cardinals because they had Matt Liner. They had Matt Liner. Fans booed Warner off the field for the number of times he fumbled and, and wanted Liner to play. Uh, it was after that that he, he sort of came around. I mean, it, are the Raiders going to are the Raiders going to trade us another franchise quarterback with a seventh round pick? <laughs> I mean, we'll take it. You know, Drew Stanton is to me he's he's a very good backup, and to me he is a he's the equivalent if is of a healthy Kevin Cobb when he's out there. He's okay. going to win you some games. He's mm-hmm. but you have to get him in a rhythm. He's not mm-hmm. a high end starter, and and I can see that. But he's talented. You can see it in practice. There is a definite drop off between Carson and Drew, and and and, and it's it's noticeable. That Carson is a top end talent, an elite thrower, um, and who's finally put it together. Yeah. You know, it, it, I every love team, Palmer. Mm-hmm. every team who has a top end starter like that, every like the Packers. I mean, how long is Aaron Rodgers going to be? Do they need to adjust mm-hmm. it now? Tom Brady and Peyton Manning is Brock Osweiler the answer? I don't know. 
So every team with an older quarterback, Tony Romo in Dallas, you, you look mm-hmm. ahead and say, well, he's good, but for how long? And mm-hmm. then what? Yeah, It's hard for a team to do that. It is. You know, they don't grow on trees, and that's why nope. teams do. That's why teams are always looking for them. The, the Cardinals were favored to win the Super Bowl. Uh, they're going to have to get past the Packers and then you know, whoever they play in that conference championship game. A lot of great games this weekend. Um, I want to get your impression. Chiefs, Patriots, um, I, I've been saying that I've got a feeling that this might be the Chiefs year, um, but they are going to face a very, very, very tough Patriots team in Foxborough. Me, I, I as well as the Chiefs have played, I look at their schedule over the last two months, including their playoff game. Mm-hmm. They haven't beat anyone of any significance for two months. They mm-hmm. do have a couple of good wins under the belts, but that, that was over two months ago. Mm-hmm. And so I mean, you still look at that team. They've got an Alex Smith-led offense. Who mm-hmm. Alex Smith is a very competent quarterback, a very mm-hmm. good quarterback. But the offense that they run, I mean... Yeah. He's no Carson Palmer. <laughs> no, I mean, the, they throw everything short of the sticks. I mean, he's perfect for Andy Reid, but in, mm-hmm. you look at, especially, is there ever a time that you can say, okay, Tom Brady on his home field, can you ever think that he's going to lose there in the playoffs? I, I can't, mm-hmm. it might, it's, in, I, it's I can't say mm-hmm. that's going to happen. So, and, and I'm not, I haven't bought into the Chiefs. I think but, Tom Brady's been there, the, done that. But the Patriots aren't playing very well right now either. No, but it's, there's two things. As long as they have Tom Brady, as long as they have Rob Gronkowski, and if they're playing in Foxborough, I like them every single time. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's really hard to pick the Chiefs. Um, but, again, you know, I think if, if they are going to beat the Patriots, this might be the year because, um, you know, the Patriots have not played all that well. They dropped their last two games. Um, but you, you're right, you never count out Tom Brady, and you never, ever count out. Wild Bill. The other AFC game, and then we'll talk about Seahawks, Panthers. The other AFC game, Steelers, Broncos. I'm really excited for that matchup. That is, wow, that's going to be fun. Um, and especially, I want to see what like, Peyton Manning. I want to yeah. see what Peyton Manning is because yeah. I've, I'm a huge Peyton Manning fan. Mm-hmm. And, and you know that this year was just not a good Peyton year. Mm-mm. It was a new offense. He clearly wasn't healthy. I, and, you know, the the arm strength is still diminishing. But yeah. then you, you're looking at Antonio Brown is looking like he might not play. Won't and play. the Steelers' mm-hmm. pass defense is horrific. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this game goes either way. Yes. Playing in Denver, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know which way this game goes. I, but I, I, I mean... <laughs> my feeling, I, my feeling, of course, you know, I'm a Peyton Manning fan, Tennessee alum. I just think, I think the Broncos are going to win that game. Uh, D'Angelo Williams, I think he's still. Um, there's some hope that he will play. Uh, you know, but they had some some young running backs that really stepped up. You know, in that last game, it's going to be fun. Seahawks Panthers. A lot of people talking about, you know, you know how narratives go. That this is this is the conference championship game. Ho hum! It's going to be a great game. There's there's no doubt whatsoever about that. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Ah, uh, this is going to be. I mean, if there's Seattle is definitely going to be up for this game, having mm-hmm. lost to Carolina in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, but playing in Carolina, that's going to be a rocking place. Mm-hmm. <sighs> And, and you saw it. You saw it against Minnesota. Mm-hmm. They didn't do much. I mean, they can be stopped. Mm-hmm. They can be stopped. Carolina's got a great defense, but I mean, you look at that Carolina team. They don't have a ton of weapons outside of Cam Newton, who's making you know Ted Ginn look just, good. Uh, no, right? <laughs> Nobody's made Ted Ginn look good except Cam Newton ever. <laughs> and so, you know. The experience that Seattle has, along with they, they do have top-end talent on defense, mm-hmm. but at the same time, they went into Seattle and beat them. And I know beating a team twice in the regular season is tough. I consider that game a toss-up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's going to, I think it's going to be a close, low-scoring game. Um, and I, I think the Panthers are going to win it. Um, I definitely think that it's going to be – Panthers, Cardinals in the conference championship game. But you're right, you know, the Seahawks are 
a very confident football team and uh, played really well in, in the last game. And Russell Wilson has been fantastic. W- really weird situation with Marshawn Lynch. What do you make of all of that? Well, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I think the cold was too much for him. You know, he's a guy who's coming back from an injury, mm-hmm. and that cold, oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't blame him. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're going to get your first game back, would you would you really want to do it in negative temperatures? Uh, he especially it, when you're talking about a groin injury like that. Yeah, yeah, and and so I I understand that, mm-hmm. but I don't understand what goes on. I mean, he's obviously a smart man and a very good passion. He's he's crucial to that what Seattle does. But does anyone really understand Marshall Lynch? No, he's I mean, not. I, and and they've been really president. good about keeping it under wraps about what mm-hmm. his actual status is. Coaches lie all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe he's not ready. I mean, that's the thing. Maybe he's just not ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's a very interesting situation. I think um, regardless of how it pans out, I think that this is Marshawn Lynch's last year in Seattle. Uh, they're going to owe him a lot of money next year. I didn't um, play as many games, you know, as as I think that they would have wanted to and would have lied. It, the off season is going to be extremely interesting. Bruce Arians is uh, one of my favorite coaches in the league. I, I love the guy. Is there any way we could possibly get him once he is um, done with the fun of being an NFL coach? Get him to be NFL commissioner. <laughs> oh, that would be a. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I would love. I, it. I, it would be great. I don't think the owners would love it because if there's one thing that he does, he speaks his mind, and he sure he's not PC. Mm-hmm. And as mm-hmm. entertaining as he would be, I, I don't think he'd make the the owners more money. I think yeah. he'd be more likely to. He'd be taking money from them. They wouldn't like that at all. Uh, speaking of the owners, kind of the big story today: the the owners meeting, their relocation talks. There's going to be conference realignment. Um, it's going to probably impact the AFC, you know, maybe more than the NFC. But I don't know. You know, I mean, they might. Uh, 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 Seattle used to be in the AFC. Uh, what do you What do you think is going to transpire there? It sounds like the favorite, I mean, what what might be the recommended situation is in Inglewood that it will be San Diego and, and St. Louis. And if that's mm-hmm. the case, I don't think there will be any necessity for realignments. I know the kind of the realignment thought was if the, you wouldn't want two AFC teams playing in the same stadium for TV purposes, you know, you're going to maximize your money uh, otherwise. And and so you, you, you treat it like this. If, if the Rams move and the Chargers move together, I think nothing changes in terms of realignment. If the Chargers and Raiders move, then then I think you look at having to, to realign things and moving either the the Raiders or the Chargers to the NFC West and shifting a, an NFC West team over to the AFC. And yes, uh Seattle does make sense and you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't cry about Seattle going to the AFC. <laughs> Cause those fans are something else. They really are. Really, really are. Jess, it's such a pleasure to have you on. It's been too long. I'm so thankful that we were able to make this happen. Tell everybody out there where they can find you and give a big plug to Revenge of the Birds. All right. Well, well, the site is revengeofthebirds.com. It's our SB Nation Arizona Cardinal site. Hit me up at Twitter at Senor Jess Root, S-E-N-O-R-J-E-S-S-R-O-O-T, or my site account, which is at Revenge of Birds. Well, good luck to the Cardinals this weekend. I'll definitely be watching. My heart's going to be torn because two of my favorite teams are playing. I do think the Cardinals are going to win, but good luck to them. And uh, let's let's hope that there are no significant injuries. All right.
All right. That was Jess Root from Revenge of the Birds. You can find that website at SB Nation. Again, full disclaimer, I've written for SB Nation. Very happy to be associated with with those guys and, and gals. They do excellent work. Uh, I'm very excited about the matchup between the Packers and the Cardinals this weekend. I'm a fan of both teams, what Bruce Arians has done in Arizona, uh, so incredible. Really love Uncle Bruce. Can we make him NFL commissioner? You know, a girl can dream. Very um, happy to see Aaron Rodgers uh, go on a tear last weekend, even though, you know, um, it was – uh, a dreadful, dreadful loss for, um, you know, for uh, the the Washington Redskins. I had picked them to win that game. Excellent season for them. Cannot overstate how well that they played. It was a weak division, but still, you know, Kirk Cousins getting the call there. We'll see what happens with Robert Griffin the third during the off season. It does seem to me that Dallas might be you know, his best landing spot. You know, maybe um, the Chargers, they don't have a backup behind Phillip Rivers yet, Drew Brees. Could they you know, possibly make a move there, bring him in? Definitely a situation to watch. Always such a pleasure to talk to Jess. These weekend matchups, um, the, the divisional round matchups, are very interesting. The Chiefs go to Foxborough to play the New England Patriots. We discussed that game, too. I do feel like, you know, it's the Chiefs' year. Can they go into Foxborough and, and get that win? I suppose that we'll see. They will need Alex Smith to um, to be the Alex Smith that I believe that he can be, and, and some other people do as well. Not that many people uh, think that Alex Smith can be a, a playmaker, can can lead a team like the Chiefs into a deep run in the playoffs. We will see Seahawks versus Panthers. Wow, that's going to be a great, great, great game. Very excited about that. If the Panthers host the conference championship, your girl Sharona is going to be in Charlotte covering that game. Very excited about that. Um, just a great, great weekend for football. I didn't get a chance to really talk about Mike Munchak. I went off on a tear um, about the Bengals and Vontaze Perfect and, and Pac-Man Jones. Uh, my, Coach Munchak is one of the finest human beings that you'll ever meet. And um, what happened with him uh, last weekend, situation with Reggie Nelson. Had Reggie Nelson, and I do believe that it was deliberate, and I do believe he took an extra shot at Coach Munchak. Had that not happened um, I don't think that you would have seen the you know the sort of reaction that you saw from him. People are going to nat- react naturally when you know, when you um, you take a, sh- a cheap shot at them, and you know I believe that that was definitely. And I, I like Reggie Nelson. Um, you know I think the Bengals are, are perhaps showing us who they are, and um, it's unfortunate, but you know I hope that the NFL doesn't come down too harshly on him. I, I find is is certainly uh, probably in order. I hope that he does not get suspended. Joey Porter, on the other hand, I definitely think that he deserves to be suspended. Uh, rather unfortunate actions from him. Definitely not a leader, not showing his leadership there. We can certainly um, do better. So, um, But I'm excited about the games this weekend. It, it's going to be a fantastic weekend of football. In addition to those games that we just discussed, there will be a big game between the Steelers and the Broncos. The Steelers going into Mile High Stadium. Can they knock off Peyton Manning and his Denver Broncos? Peyton Manning with a very interesting um, season. The old man still still getting it done, though not in the way that, that we're accustomed to seeing. I do think that uh, the Broncos are going to win that football game. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, they'll, you know, of course, need their defense to to play uh, as well as as we've seen them play. They ne- they'll need to get a good running game going. It's going to be uh, an exciting game. The home teams have not done all that well so far in in the playoffs. In, in looking at the schedule, I predict that at least three out of the four home teams will walk away 
with that win this weekend. I think that you're going to see the home field advantage uh, be everything that you think that it can be in in these next games. And, you know, in the first uh, round uh, of these playoffs, you saw some some teams have to go on the road that were probably stronger and better than than the home teams that they faced. You won't see that this time around. You'll definitely see you know, the home teams utilize that home field advantage to to their benefit. I hope that Peyton Manning um, does have a good game. I hope that he's able to go out in in a way that um, you know that he deserves. No matter what you think about Peyton Manning, he's definitely been one of the best to ever play the game, and, and I think that he you know, that he deserves that. So we'll take a quick break. When we come back, our final segment, the final 30 minutes of this show, we're going to be talking about David Bowie, his legacy. We want to talk about heroes, what they mean to us, what it means for for us, not just as individuals, but as a society. You know how we choose to remember and acknowledge our heroes, David Bowie, no doubt whatsoever, but that he is, was a brilliant uh, performer, a brilliant artist. He, as most brilliant people are, though, um, you know, as, as as all humans are, we all have a dark side. We all make mistakes, and how we choose to remember and acknowledge those things, I think it says a lot about us how we um allow people to show their human side and what we you know, what we um you know how we talk about uh, people who um who are human and and do have flaws it really does say, say a lot about us so stay tuned in you're listening to back talk with Sharona Welcome back. You're tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I'm your host. My name is Sharona. Once again, thanks for tuning in. This segment of the show, this final segment of the show, the final word with Sharona, this is where Sharona gets to weigh in on topics that are near and dear to her heart. And as we've been discussing throughout this show, and as the music for this show indicates, today's topic is David Bowie. David Bowie died on Monday at the age of 69, just two days past his 69th birthday, in fact, where he released his final album, which, as it turns out, his last two albums, actually, were his goodbye to the music world, to his fans, to the world in general. David Bowie, a brilliant, brilliant artist and performer, uh, and, and like all of us, a, a very much a flawed man, a man with a dark side, a man whose legacy cannot and should not be defined simply by the music alone. It says a lot about us, not only as individuals, but as a society, who we allow to be human and who we don't allow to be human. And I've talked about that on this show before and we're going to devote this segment, the final word segment, to that and, and to discussing the darker side as well as the brilliance of David Bowie. David Bowie's music catalog is perhaps unparalleled in in the music world. Throughout the course of his career, Bowie produced over 100 
singles, 120 singles. He um, his his discography is so extensive. He had 49 compilation albums, 27 studio albums, nine live albums. He was in the movies. He was in one of my favorite movies, Labyrinth. Um, he was a painter. He was a photographer. He was a Renaissance man in every sense of the word. His artistic endeavors are prolific, um, and so were, allegedly, his conquests. And like many peers of his generation, artists, entertainers, and otherwise, he was also involved with the underage groupie scene, a scene that we dearly love to idealize and um, romanticize and Hollywoodize, I suppose is the best way to put that. Um, Laurie Matrix infamously recorded her experience with Bowie, where he is credited with deflowering her at the ripe age of 13 years old. There's a very excellent Salon article by Aaron Keene dis- discussing this. Um, certainly wasn't the only groupie he was allegedly involved with, uh, but he was the the subject in in many respects of this um, introspective by by Lori Mat- Maddox uh, later on in, in her life. If you haven't had a chance to read that, we'll be tweeting out all of these articles. is is very fascinating. Uh, she does not in any shape, form, or fashion uh, criticize him or any of the other rock stars of his generation for their involvement with her and other underage groupies. In fact, she has some some very interesting comments to say about to say about that. Um, she she says that that was a a great time in her life that um she she knew exactly what she was doing that she was not taking taken advantage of and i believe her you know there's there's no reason whatsoever why we should not believe her one of the themes that you know that i talk about and that is a strong theme on this show is that women should tell their stories um they should tell their truth they should remain true to who they are, when we try to be what society wants us to be, it's inauthentic, and it comes through as inauthentic. Now, society is not always kind to us when when we show our true selves, when we act true to our nature, true to who we are, uh, because a lot of times that conflicts with what society wants us to be with the image of what, quote, unquote, the perfect woman should be, the perfect young girl should be, be the perfect movie star should be. Um, I had a chance to talk about uh, a story by a um, an, a very famous young Hollywood movie star who, you know, was forced to hide her, um, her out-of-wedlock daughter that was the product of a date rape. Uh, because of what society expected her her to be on an earlier show, and um, you know it, stories like that really illustrate the difficulty that that comes from being a woman. You know that comes from societal expectations that are transposed upon women that force us a lot of times to to hide our stories or to distort our stories in a way that that we believe that society would find to be you know acceptable we talked about there was a uh, we did a segment a few weeks ago maybe actually a couple of months ago where we talked about uh a serial rapist and rather tragic situation involving a young woman in that story where you know she told the truth she told her story and nobody believed her and she was forced to recant and was criminally charged um for that recantation and as it turns out originally she was telling the truth uh, 
I hope that in in discussing these things and that in having these conversations we'll hear less and less about those stories, about those tragedies where you know, women's voices are silenced or where um, we're, we're forced to or encouraged to um, to tell the story that people want to hear rather than the story that needs to be told, the truth, the story that needs to be told. But back to David Bowie and Lori Maddox. Um, the title of the article is... Uh, I Lost My Virginity to David Bowie, Confessions of a 70s Groupie. It, it really is fascinating. Uh, again, we'll be we'll be tweeting this out. Maddox was a, a young woman who ran around with uh, some of the other infamous groupies of, of her age. The movie Almost Famous is largely based on stories you know, circulating around about those um, those young women. One of them was Sable Star. She was infamous as well uh, at the time, and, and and you know, into this day, people look at those stories, and, and a lot of people don't see anything wrong with it. And she certainly did not see anything wrong with it. Um, when asked in, in this article if there was anything unusual about that, this is how she responded. Um, I was an innocent girl, but the way that it happened was so beautiful. I remember him looking like God and having me over a table who wouldn't want to lose their virginity to David Bowie. And later on she says, um, no, you need to understand that my life has never been normal. I have always been special. I always felt like the universe was taking care of me. It's really a fascinating look into, you know, maybe I don't want to speak for her. I don't want to uh, diminish in any way the story that that she wants to tell. This is her story. She should tell it the way um the way she, you know she feels that it needs to be told. But in a lot of ways it is rather tragic and it is I think very telling you know how the story does come off her mother uh, not only did she know about it, but it, it does appear that she actually encouraged it there were a lot of really great great quotes um in that article but you know i think that hopefully we can learn a lot from that do we live in different times um she doesn't really think that we do and i think that she has a great point she points to the fact that um you know, today you've got the the you know, your your Kendall Jenners, your Kylie Jenners, uh, your you know, Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton were partying, and you're probably doing the same thing um, at her age. And they not only are celebrated for it, um, but you know, as she points out, they make money off of it. And I think that it says a lot about us, you know, as a society that while we profess and pretend that um statutory rape is wrong, we oftentimes idealize things that show that we're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. So, um you know, David Bowie you know, was certainly presented with a situation where, as the adult in you know in that situation, he could have made a different choice. He could have chose you know another interesting story that came out from that was that um uh, they in, continued to engage in a relationship, and his first wife angie um caught them sort of rather caught them at at it and uh, those two ultimately divorced. He he married another. He married Iman, who is a very famous model. Um, but you know he could have chosen not to take what was offered to him. And these young women were offering themselves to um, you know to these rock star stars. Did they know what they were doing? She says that they did. I think that in my mind, there's certainly a question. You know, a lot of times we look back on our life and 
the things that we have done and we attempt to rationalize, you know, the our behavior and our um you know what what we've done and what we've engaged in and um you know uh, again I don't want to speak for her I don't want to um to come across like her story is any you know less important because you know I might have questions about how she looks back on it but yeah, at 13, 14, 15 years old, you are not fully developed. You are, you're not mature. And as the adult in the situation, you know, it certainly would have been beholden on, on Bowie and, and his peers, you know, not to take advantage of the situation. But that wasn't what was going on back then. It was, and and it, and it still goes on today. Let's be real here. This is not isolated it's not a situation where um where you know we've changed a great deal i think we're still the only thing that has changed is that we're now willing to talk about it and to discuss it in a in a more open fashion um the the other interesting thing about the story is that there is and there always is in these situations very much a mindset and a thought process and a blowback to not report. I did not know. I, I guess, I, you know, at some point I'm sure that I knew that David Bowie was, um, you know, screwing around with underage groupies. But you know, I'm guilty, as anybody, of you know, having uh, a, a thought process that you know, focuses on the things that 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 you want to remember in a way that you want to remember them. Uh, the other you know, part of this and the thing that I did not know was that he had been accused of rape and had been had gone through uh, at least the initial stages of of the court system. The woman who accused him of that pressed charges. The grand jury declined to indict him. Uh, it's it's interesting that as we talk about David Bowie and, and talk about David Bowie's legacy, uh, there are people that don't want to discuss these things. They want to focus on the um, you know the artistic endeavors and all the the wonderful and great stuff that he did. But I think that we do a disservice not only to David Bowie but to ourselves if we look at things in that one-dimensional fashion. David Bowie was a man. He was a flawed human being, just like we all are. He did things that um, were probably not the best things to be doing. Um, I don't know whether he learned from that. I don't know, know what the latter stages of his life, I don't know what it was like. Um, But you know our heroes oftentimes have clay feet they have you know things that they have done that um reveal them to be human and that reveal them to be less than perfect and we need to allow them to to be that because in doing so it allows us the freedom to allow other people to be human and to be fallible and to you know to um to not live up to the ideals that we want them to live up to and i think one of the reasons why it's so important for me um for us to do that is i see that a lot and and i talk a lot about violence against women and and being a survivor you know and being someone who's very much an advocate for for survivors if you are willing to allow your heroes to be flawed human beings, why won't you allow your victims that same opportunity, that same humanness, that same quality that we all have, that we make mistakes, that sometimes maybe we misremember things, that sometimes maybe we don't want to remember things, that sometimes maybe when bad things happen to us, we don't always act in the way that 
people expect us to act. That, um, you know, maybe, just maybe, you know, we engage in activity that's designed to forget those things. And that is designed to, um, you know, to to feel better, to feel good. Um, if your heroes are allowed to be human, maybe you'll allow your victims to be human as well. Just, um, you know, a little food for thought. But um but you know, back to David Bowie. I'm going to uh, I'm going to allow him to still be that artistic genius that he was. I'm still going to admire his music, his artistic endeavors, his movies, the the good work that he did for black artists, for the gay community, for trans for the the trans community, for the alt community. Um, it's important what those things that he did it, it's important um but I'm also going to recognize and allow him to be human, and in doing so, hopefully you know I'll be a better person and um, maybe if we all do that, we'll all be better people. All right, so that's it for the final word. We're going to take another quick break. when we come back. We'll be wrapping it up. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I'm your host. My name is Sharona. Stay tuned in. That's it for today. I do need to to make a correction from something that I said in the final word. Lori Maddox was 15, not 13. I apologize for um, for for messing that up and for not getting her name right. <laughs> Probably more than once. Lori Maddox, M A T T I X, uh, often known as Maddox, M A D D O X or U X. Uh, again, we'll be tweeting out those articles as well as Ralph Sendrick's website, the Revenge of the Birds website, information on how to follow Ralph Sendrick and Jess Root as well as Revenge on, of the Birds on social media. A uh, shout out to both of those guys for joining me. Always great stuff. Always such a pleasure to talk to both of them and and to have them on this show. We're back to a two-show-per-week format Boys, I'm back. Um, On Friday, Josh Taylor and Blake Meek will be joining me. I already had Vance, uh, Blake's brother, on last week, I believe it was. Very excited to welcome both of those gentlemen to to this show. We'll be talking some Pittsburgh Steelers. We'll revisit the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, Big news that was occurring while we were uh, getting ready for today's show. Hugh Jackson to the uh, Cincinnati, to the Cleveland Browns. Interesting choice by Hugh Jackson. It did look like he was going to have an opportunity perhaps with the 49ers or with the Giants. He opted instead for the Cleveland Browns. Uh, He also uh, is reportedly going to be moving on from young Johnny Menzel. That's not a terrible shock. Uh, We'll see what he elects to do with their quarterback situation. Interesting times in the National Football League. We'll talk some relocation on Friday, a topic that has been burning up the airwaves this week. We didn't get a chance to really discuss it that much today. We had other things that that we opted to discuss. Um, Hope that you enjoyed uh, my chat with Jess Root and with Ralph Sendrick, as well as my thoughts um, in the final word on David Bowie. 
Again, you've been listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I'm your host. My name is Sharona. I do sincerely appreciate you, um, all the listeners out there, for tuning in and and for all of the interaction out there in, in Twitter land, on social media, and elsewhere. Uh, be sure to check out my Wednesday night show, Going for Two, with Zach Law. Tonight we have uh, Keith Myers, Cincinnati, Cincinnati. I got Cincinnati on the mind, you guys. Seattle Seahawks guy, 12th Man Rising, his blog, his website. We'll be talking about that matchup, I'm sure, as well as other things. We'll be back on Friday, 2 o'clock p.m., Central Daylight Time with Josh Taylor and Blake Meek. I'm your host. You've been listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Sports by Sharona. I hope that you have a very pleasurable rest of your day, or if you're li- listening to this um, as a pre as a record, um, whatever day that you're listening to it. I hope that you're doing well. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Friday, and that's it. <laughs>